fast bullets fly, oh they fly. Little children die, oh they die. For gas, bombs and tears, there's no answer to their fears. As through the coming years, they'll wonder why, wonder why. As through the coming years, they'll wonder why. Could you tell me a bit about your background and how and when you first got involved in the Republican movement? I was about 17 when I first got in the Republican movement. Um, the family had moved up from the country uh, shortly before uh, I joined the Republican movement. And don't know like what made me join it at the time, but there was a kind of, like there was a kind of republicanism in my in the family background anyway. So maybe maybe it was just a natural progression for me. And I joined Sinn Fein and think this it was called the uh, the Jackie Griffith Common and this is 1953 and I remained a member of the Republican movement for the next 12 to 13 years and most of that time I was either in Sinn Féin or in the Common Cowork. The last two and a half years uh, of that 13 years uh, was in the IRA. Now, back in the 50s, there was a, how would you put it, a lot of residual kind of uh, republicanism going back to the, maybe back to the time of the Civil War and the IRA campaign against the state. Um, back in the 30s and 40s and republicanism was a pretty alive enough issue at the time and when I joined Sinn Féin there wasn't much in the line of we say political education People kind of had to find out for themselves, and other than the odd lecture, uh, there really wasn't any political education. And one of our, our main activities was really selling East of Lilies or selling the monthly paper around the pubs. And there was usually a, a kind of a get together or a, a public meeting down on Abbey Street. Uh, usually on a Friday or a Saturday night. Now this is a kind of the early to mid 50s. Now around that time as well the IRA were beginning to uh, make themselves known after a series of uh, army, British army barracks uh, were raided in England And people were arrested and imprisoned, and of course, this generated its own publicity for the Republican movement. And it might have been, I think it was 1956, after Sean South and O'Handon were killed, that uh, all of a sudden I wanted to join the IRA. So, over the next over the next while, I made several attempts, but they weren't recruiting. And I was told at the time that most of the people that were doing the training and stuff like that were either 
they were either interned in the Dakota or they were on the run and so I was left to my own devices. I didn't get into the IRA any of at that time. And my activities then were mainly to do with uh, Uncrum and Crowbrook, which was involved in uh, collecting money for the, the prisoners and their dependents. Now, coming into the kind of uh, mid sixties, then for work reasons, I had to go to uh, I had to go to London for work. And for the next few years, then uh, homesickness and wanting another would drive me back home every year or two. And I think it would have been 1958. I made another attempt to get into the IRA, and I was told given the same answer, people were locked up and so I, I took it on my own initiative then to uh, to go get my own training and I joined the, uh, the British Army. I stayed there for a while and uh, I had intended to stay longer than I did but uh, the unit that I was in, this is the Parachute Regiment, we were told that we were being uh, sent off to Cyprus, so I didn't fancy that and I uh, went absent without leave, which that position remains to this day. So, the work situation was bad here at the time and I had to go to England again for work and This time, I had to go under uh, a different name. So, I spent the next couple of years, much the same, back and forward, back and forward. And eventually, I think, I was back home one time uh, in around 19... 62, 63, and uh, somebody told me that the IRA had been reformed, and if I was still interested, I could apply. So I done that, and I was eventually uh, drafted into uh, a local unit of the IRA on the north side of the city, or the Dublin city. And after about six months, uh, the OC of the day uh, resigned. He was one of the, shall we say, the, the people who were involved in the campaign uh, back in the 50s. So he resigned and I was approached to see whether I would uh, be interested in the position of OC. So I accepted and I was brought uh, to a meeting with uh, the chief of staff of the day and the adjutant. Sorry, was that Catherine Gooden? Catherine Gooden was chief of staff, yeah, mm -hmm. and, um, and Seamus Fessler was the adjutant. And I was kind of given directions uh, as to how I should go about uh, like, like building up the units. Now, the area at that time, this was uh, 1963, was in very bad shape. There was no, uh, there was no weapons of any description, and people were, were kind of left to their own devices as to how to proceed, and I don't think anybody knew in what direction the IRA was going then. Uh, we didn't know whether we were preparing for a, another campaign in the north or, or, or what the position was. So, fellas, like the volunteers, 
they were, after a while, like they become restless because like they didn't know what the aims are, like where the IRA was gone. And I done my best to keep them um, involved and keep them active in some ways or other. And I had several projects which I got them working on. Um, one was uh, I gave a few of them. Uh, the job of getting whatever information they could in Nelson Spiller. And all our little information gathering uh, projects around the city. Uh, I also was given the names of well, this is over a period of time I was given the names of um, maybe ten or twelve individuals out in the Bray and O'Leary area and I set up two units uh, one in Bray and one in O'Leary and And, and uh, of course, they had the same problems out there. Like there was no, uh, there was nothing much in the line of interest, like to keep them occupied. So I gave I gave some of them projects to, and what happened then was that. The uh, the headquarter people in the IRA got to know about these units. I had kept them kind of quiet and secret up to then. And they used this then as a pretext to, uh, to get rid of me. Now this was in, uh, in the middle of uh, 1965. And oh yeah, another thing too I forgot to I forgot to say was as I said like there, there was no uh, there was no weapons uh, of any description just one or two little uh, drill purpose weapons which were good for nothing anyway. But I was given uh, the location of a of an arms dump in Ashbourne. So a couple of us went out to Ashburn one night, we dug up the arms dump and we took it into a house in Fingness and we spent the next two or three months kind of cleaning it up and but it turned out the arms dump was just one big mass of rust. There wasn't a decent weapon amongst the whole lot of it and yet there was enough there to fill the, the boot of two cars. So, anyway, as I said, I was dismissed anyway. And dismissed, uh, I must say, like in friendly enough terms. Like whatever equipment and, and stuff that belonged to the IRA, I gave it back. And I left for England then. So, and, and when you were in England, would you have met uh, Jerry Lawless? And uh, would you have uh, any involvement with the Irish Workers Group? Well, not at that time. Yeah. Like this was uh, this was 1965. Uh, I had known them beforehand, just just vaguely of their existence, and I had gone to some of their some of their public meetings down in uh, down at Marble Arch. But when I went back then, when I went, returned to London anyway in 1965, I got to know the, the Irish Workers Group a bit better and i became become a regular at 
the meetings uh, down in the, in the Lucas Arms, down on uh, I think it was Grayson Road. And so I got to them all, I got to know like most of them and was eventually and I become friendly enough with one or two of them and sometime I think it was 1966 or 67, uh, Jerry Lawless, who kind of ran the Irish Workers Group at the time, he asked me could he co-op me out to the executive for the sole reason of getting of getting rid of uh, people within the group who was uh, Stalinist kind of inclinations, and I agreed to I agreed to this anyway, and the situation came to a head in one night, and the uh, and the Stalinists were ousted from the from the group. Now some of them, some of them people surfaced in Dublin then a couple of years later. So we'll get onto that. We'll get onto that later on. Jerry Lawless was quite famous anyway, wasn't he? Before that, for a number of things. Yeah, Jerry Lawless was pretty well known. Yeah. Um, he, he was pretty well known back here in the back in the fifties, and I think he had been been interned as well. And I think he hit the headlines one time when he was arrested on possession of weapons and I think he argued his case or somebody argued his case for him and the judge ordered the police to give him the weapons back, which of course made headlines in a lot of the papers at the time. So I don't know, I don't know what happened then outside, the police probably took them off and began. But anyway, uh, as I say, just as going back to London now in, in the mid sixties, I got to know these people pretty well, and I, I was interested enough in their politics, and I think that that the lack of politics in the Republican movement here. Back in the fifties, kind of made me very amenable towards the politics of the uh, of the workers' group. There were there were Marxist Leninists, was were trying to a Trotskyite, how do you put it, a Trotskyite leaning, and I found that. Trotskyism, even though I, I couldn't argue the ins and outs of it very well, but it sat easy enough for my shoulders. And and sometimes on reflection, I, I, I feel that, that if James Connolly had lived, he might have been a Trotskyite. Or if Trotsky had lived, he might have been a Connollyite. So it was that kind of a situation anyway. And... I suppose the next thing of, of any interest then would have been sometime in 1967 I met some people over in London whom I had known or who were in the IRA here in Dublin and we had a chat about different things, and uh, and it was made clear that there was a lot of kind of disaffection with with the Republican movement or with the IRA in particular in Dublin. And they were interested in my views and what happened to me, like when like that I had to leave and. So, I suppose the next thing of any interest in was that I returned home sometime in 1967, late in 67, and I met up with some of these people, and I think this is where maybe the, the seeds of 
Syria might have been formed at that time because the people were, for the most part, they were chased off with the Republican movement of the day and especially as or with the appearance of people who are in the Connolly Association in Britain all of a sudden seemed to surface in Dublin and were very, very kind of chummy with the uh, with the Republic movement of the time. Now I for one didn't like this because the Connolly Association was not held in very high esteem with a lot of the Irish uh, around London. And one of the reasons I think for that would have been that the Connolly Association had been in existence I think since the 1930s. But at one of their meetings uh, the hanging of Tommy Williams was condoned and that kind of turned me off them. Plus the fact that they were affiliated, as far as I know, with the, uh, with the British Communist Party. So, as I say, I was back in Dublin, you know, some of these Connellyites were there already and they were kind of in deep shall we say, with, with the Republican movement and from that time on uh, I couldn't see myself ever trying to even get back into the Republican movement. So, At that time you were in Dublin there was an attempt to burn down Fianna Fáil headquarters. Do you, uh, could you tell me anything about that? Ah uh, yeah, well... I was involved in that and it was just a stunt. Uh, got a little bit of publicity but I got uh, I got six months in prison myself and Simon O'Donnell. We got six months each. So we did our time and we were there again sometime uh, in 1968. And how did uh, Sarah see the struggle for freedom developing? and its own role within that. And what was their era's politics? I mean, were they Trotskyites? Um, were they traditional Republican? How would you describe them? Well, I, I suppose like the group that I was involved with initially were the raw, the raw ex-Republicans uh, with a sprinkling of maybe anarchists as well. But I think the heart was in the right place, but uh, the politics, uh, uh, I, I think, was not very strong. Uh, they had Republican leanings, but I don't think there was any great leanings towards the left as such, even though I think they were open. They were a group that were open to... Uh, how would you put it to, uh, well, not to be brainwashed, but they were open to change anyway. Mm -hmm. now, and um, how did, uh, like, Sarah Era, like, when, like, what was the whole reason for setting up Sarah Era, and we, did you help to set them up? Did you say, or, or did you know? Or as I say, like, I, I, I was involved. Uh, I was involved from the start, uh, but like my main, uh, my main involvement was to try and, and link up, if you like, the politics of the of the workers' group in London with uh, with these. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call them rogue elements, but all these stray kind of Republican elements that was knocking around Dublin at the time. And I could see the potential there for maybe a militant group of some description. 
not along the, the lines of the IRA, but maybe a group that could could get involved um, in different activities and like where it was needed and bring kind of issues to a forefront like whenever it was possible. And could you tell us about Sarah in Cork and could you tell us about Sarah actions in the north in uh, 1969? Well, I heard, I believe there was a, a Sarah in Cork that was, I didn't know anything or much about them. Uh, but I was always under the impression that, uh, that Dublin Sierra was kind of in the field first. Now, we had uh, maybe six or seven people in Cork who were affiliated to us, but whether they were affiliated to Cork Sierra as well, uh, I, I couldn't say. I, I'd have to go and maybe ask or see them people in person to find out. But they were always they were always amenable and uh, they were always there and were always ready to play their part if, if they were needed. Now, as far as here in the north is concerned, I don't I couldn't enlighten you there one way or the other because I I, I just don't know. Like Sierra was in Derry in sixty nine, weren't they? There may have been, there was a sprinkling of people, I think, in the north who would have maybe liked the idea of Sierra, but I don't think there was enough of them in either Derry or Belfast or anywhere else to uh, to form a unit or... No. Could, could you tell us something about uh, Peter Graham? Uh, and the question asked, was he involved in the armed struggle? I know he was involved politically, he was very active with the young socialists and stuff yeah, like well, that. See, Peter Graham... I recruited Peter Graham to Sierra Air, and I think it was... would have been early 69. I'm not sure where I met him first, but I could have met him in London at some stage, and then I later... Uh, met him in, in Dublin. Because he was in the International Marketers Group in, in England, in London. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, uh, I liked his politics, I liked his ideas, and I liked the whole thrust of his... Uh, of where or what he wanted to do, and... So I approached him and he was about CIA and we said we kind of come to an agreement that uh, he was the, I think, the secretary of the Young Socialists at the time. And the agreement was that uh, we give each other a dig out where and when we could. So that's more or less the, the thing we see with Peter Graham. Mm -hmm. Now, while I'm on that, you might remember that uh, when I had been, I had been co-opted onto the uh, the executive of the Irish Workers Group in London. Now, at that time, I think Peter Graham made the odd appearance. But when the standards were ousted, there was a bit of rancor there and a kind of a bit of, it was a kind of a bit of split. And then I'd say it would have been maybe 69 or 70, some of these standards appeared in Dublin. And they appear to ingratiate themselves into 
I'd say, disparate, if that's the word, elements of people who proposed or, or, or who pose as members of Sierra Era. Now, I, I, I won't mention names or, or whatever, but I have a feeling that somehow that these people, the Stalinists, might have poisoned the minds of uh, these disparate elements and that Peter Graham's murder could very well have resulted from this. Now, I can't be too sure, but it's just a feeling I have. So, so where do we go from there? Well, there's uh, another person to, when you talk about the Irish Workers Group or Sarah Era, it's um, Liam Dalton. Oh, yeah, well, I, I know Liam Dalton from the early, uh, from the early 60s. We got on great. And he was very well read and we knew the ins and outs of left-wing politics better than anybody I knew. And Right, he wasn't uh, he wasn't as a member of CIA as such, but he was prepared to to help out in, in any way he could. And I think it would have been maybe sometime early in '69. I tried to ask him would he become involved in. In, in helping to draft a manifesto for Sierra. So he agreed to that and he had a group, I think, working in London or, or, like, with that intention of, of getting the manifesto out. However, around that time, I think that the, the workers' group had a split and I think the manifesto was put on the back shelf, and unfortunately, it didn't. It didn't. It, it never surfaced until I think maybe the late seventies. Seventy one. Seventy seventy one. Yeah. But it was kind of on the back. How would you say? The idea of it had been in vogue, shall we say, for for since late 68 or early 69 and if I have any regrets at all about, about them days it, it, it's the very fact that uh, this manifesto didn't suffer in time. And so did, was Liam Dalton the, the, the document that you can see now, the Sarah Era manifesto, is, was that his draft? He'd have helped. Yeah. I, I'm not sure who who he had around him. I, I, I think heard it was Peter Graham, is that true? That Peter Graham yeah. was probably there as well, and some of the other left-wing people in England. Because they all worked in the Red Mole, That's the right. IMG paper, didn't they? Yeah. So, as I say, like, that was one of the big regrets that the, this, uh, this thing never surfaced in time, because... Had it uh, had it been out in the public realm, I feel that Sierra might have survived the uh, the aftermath of the of the Gala Valentine, uh, mainly because after Gala Valentine was killed, there were a lot of doors, Republican doors, I might say, who were shut against us, and a lot of people who. Otherwise, were would have been sympathetic. I mean, shut against us as well. But I feel that had the manifesto been out around us, we would have survived the other founding far better than we did. Well, then, can can you tell us uh, something about the state repression after the Aaron Key bank raid, in which a, a guard was killed in 1970? Well, I, I can't. Uh, There was a certain amount of uh, repression against, uh, 
shall we say, known or supposedly members of Sierra Era. And I suppose the Republican movement has a certain amount of flack from them as well. Like houses of uh, sympathizers or raids or regular and so, like beyond that I don't know because I, I I was I was doing my own thing at the time and Could you tell me something about the uh, trial that you were acquitted and about your time on uh, remand in England? Yeah, well... The Garda found thing, the first, the first I heard of that uh, the Garda had been killed was at lunchtime on the day it happened and I ran into, uh, I was coming into the Larry from, from the south side, from, from, from the Bray direction. And there was a, a roadblock, a guard of roadblock on, on the main street. So I seen them up ahead and I pulled down the side street and I parked the van. And I walked up and I went into a pub. This is at lunchtime, around one o'clock and the thing was all over the, it was all over the news, all over the telly. And at the time I didn't know it was a, a Syria or a bank raid. So I hung around anyways. I kept my head down until dark that evening and then I made contact with some other members of Syria and uh, I discovered then that, yeah, it was uh, a Syria of bank raid. So, anything else? And um, well, um, about the trial, you were, you were arrested then, and uh, oh, oh yeah, well, were, two were, days were later, charged, but I, I can't remember now mm -hmm. if what day of the week it was, but it might have been on the, on Saturday on, on the Saturday evening's paper. Uh, the names of uh, seven or eight names. Were printed in big in, in big type on the front of some of the uh, and some of the uh, I think it would have been the Sunday papers. And now papers as to how they were allowed to do that and get away with it, I don't know. But it's not the kind of thing that would happen now. So I immediately uh, I wrote a letter. To the to the papers, um, like denying the involvement, and I actually uh, and I signed uh, I signed the I signed the letter with my thumbprint and my signature on top of it. So I got a bit of publicity as well. So anyway, I had to uh, I had to lay low then for a while because. Uh, Place were red and everywhere, left, right, and center, and and then, as I said, I kept my head down for a while. I was trying to get on with the business of CIA as best I could, but I found it impossible. So I decided then that I had more freedom of movement if I went to England. So I done that. I got to England and. I, I just proceeded as what I was doing all along in England. So until uh, until I was arrested then around uh, I think it was the Whit just after the Whit weekend in uh, in 1970. This would have been maybe six or seven weeks after after Gardafal was killed, you know. So, anything else? Um, so, uh, the trial, what happened at the trial? Well... And sorry, how long were you, were you remanded for a long time? Were you there like a year or something like that in England? Oh, oh yeah, when 
I was arrested anyway, make a long story short. I was arrested at, uh, at a tube station. Uh, Highbury tube station, Highbury corner tube station. And I was brought down, I was brought, and it was at the local police station, I was questioned and I was kept there then for, I don't know, was it one or two nights. And eventually, uh, a guard, a inspector or chief inspector or something, uh, came over from Dublin, and I informed him I, I wasn't answering any questions, blah blah blah. And uh, he charged me there, there and then, in front of uh, in, in 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 the in the police station. He charged me with. Uh, with Gary Lefalle's uh, murder. Now, I refused to uh, to return to Dublin at the time, and somebody on the outside, I guess, the solicitor from me. Was that Bo Zegan, the People's Democracy? Are you a solicitor? No, mm -hmm. no, the man's name was Birnberg. So I said I wanted to contest the uh, any extradition that might be sought. So eventually the whole thing then went through the House of Lords and that took it must have taken ten or eleven months. And I got a lot of help, a lot of support from people in this country and in England. But I was eventually, Thurston uh, Lord's energy refused to, to turn down the extradition uh, the, uh, against me being extraditors. And I was brought back here then, whenever it was, May or June of 1971. And it would have been a few weeks later then I stood trial. Now, a lot of things happened in between that, but. They say like it's very hard to remember everything now. Uh, I was taken out of uh, when I was in. Well, whilst awaiting extradition, I was in um, in Brixton, and there was several other Irish people there. Six they were all connected with the provost. Beyond that, uh, I don't remember all that much of it. So then you were acquitted. But were you? Did they arrest you for after you were acquitted? Did you, did you get arrested for? Uh, oh, oh yeah. Bank I, I, and... I stood trial anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, after I come back, I stood trial mm -hmm. uh, for the guard of Alan uh, Kieran, and uh, I was acquitted. Why they ever charged me, I don't know, because there were absolutely no direct evidence to put me anywhere near Arden Key that day and a policeman, one policeman in particular, perjured himself and he contradicted witness statements, I don't know how many dozens of witnesses who said that all the people, the raiders, who were at the bank that day, were all disguised. But this man, this policeman, said no. But he said none of the raiders were, were disguised. And yes, the guard that was driving the squad car, who had just as good a view as he did, said all the raiders had disguises on. So it was that kind of a situation. As I say, I should never have been brought for trial, but I have a feeling that the police wanted to... Uh, just wanted to, to show that they were in, in control, they were in charge, and that they had the people that done it. And 
I was kind of a, shall we say, a lamb to the slaughter. But I say I was lucky enough to get out of it. The state could not make a case during the trial, and I don't think the jury didn't take too long to uh, to acquit me. The judge uh, released me. I was free to go, and as soon as I stepped out the door of the courthouse, uh, I was rearrested. This time, something to do with uh, a robbery of uh, a bank and uh, a gun shop in Metro. And so, a short time later, then a few days later, then I got bail. I stood trial for the uh, for the Rathrum. Then maybe it might have been a year later. And this time it was before the special court. So the special court didn't deliberate too long either and they threw the case out. So at that point I was free. Um, Sarah were prisoners issued a statement in May 1973 certifying their resignation from Sarah era as they believed it has ceased to play a progressive role. What happened to Sarah era? Why did it fail? Well, I can only answer that by maybe going back to the time when So I, I was uh, I was released from the after the Garda Fallon trial and I was back out in the in the shall we say in the public again and the whole the whole complexion of the the Sierra era that existed then at that time but completely different from the Sierra era that was there prior to uh, the Arden Key bank raid. Um, now, something like maybe a year and a half had gone by from the time that uh, Gadafana was killed until I was, uh, my child was over and I was free again. But the same area that I come out to seemed to me to have been diluted, if that's the right word, and it seemed to comprise a lot of old time Republicans from from the 1950s and even a few from the 1940s and as far as I could see they were mainly interested in gathering funds and looking trying try to get arms for the uh, for the provost and there was no there was little or no like political, how would you say, political input into what they were at. Like they, they seemed to be quite content with the republicanism, bar one or two people. Uh, Peter Graham would have been one, Mary Maureen Keegan would have been another. But as I say, they were mostly old time republicans, and there was even one or two from whom. I had known to have been like with the stickies. So I didn't know which way to jump and I wasn't sure who was on my side. So I tagged along I'd, as best I could for a while and I didn't seem to be making any progress. And 
at that time, or around that time, then again, like uh, two or three of our people uh, were arrested in Baldoyle and they ended up in prison. And on top of that, but then, I suppose, not too long a time after that, Peter Graham had, had been killed, and Liam Dalton and Maureen Keegan, all are gone within a short space of time. And all of a sudden, I, I, I just felt that the whole bottom had fallen out of everything. And I, I didn't want to try to be involved in a group that was Digging, given the pro was a dig out, because that would have been kind of contrary to everything that I had been working for for some time. So, see, uh, I suppose just to put it bluntly, it just ran into the sand. It didn't go any further. And the people that were left, they didn't know which way to go. And some of them, I think, ended up with Seamus Gosselow and... A few more just done their own thing and they helped out the pros as best they could. But to all intents and purposes, like I say, by by the time that uh, the statement was issued from the prisoners in Portage, uh, like Sarah or the dead took at that time. And like that's the story of that. Like, like the police, it wasn't the police that broke it. Uh, as I say, it just ran into the sand and I had nowhere to go. Yeah, you mentioned uh, some people joined at Seamus Costello. Did you know Seamus Costello? Could you tell us something about him? I, I knew Seamus Costello from, uh, from actually from, from 1963 on. And he was a very, very, very capable at what he'd done. And... The only, I suppose, the, like the only thing for my part is that we found ourselves at kind of on different ends of the spectrum. When uh, I, uh, when I was discharged from our court martial to the IRA, uh, he remained in it. But nonetheless, we kept in contact. You know, practically right up to the time he got killed. So and I, I found them, I say, if I could make a list of the, of the ten, of, of, of ten people from that period whom I would have trusted with my life, uh, I think Seamus Costler would have been one of them. So he was a great loss, wasn't he? Oh, he was a big loss, yeah. a huge loss. Yeah, so. um, could you give your view of the uh, hunger strikes? view of the hunger strikes uh, like what can I won't say except that the people that, that that took these hunger strikes on like knew what they were at and it was a su supreme sacrifice on their part and it's not the kind of thing that anybody would get involved in and do, do you remember the Sean McNeilis funeral when you were oh boy? yeah I was only a, I, I was only a kid at the time I, I'd only been about 10 years 10 years of age but the biggest uh, I'd, I'd say it would have been the biggest funeral of its time in the town in my town uh, in Mayo uh, where uh I, I think Sean McNeil is for the, the coffin was taken from the train and brought down to his home, his home village down in Ballycry. And I say it was the biggest, biggest funeral I ever remembered going in, in that town at the time. 
Now, I, I don't remember much about, I couldn't say a terrible lot about the the emotions of people or anything like that, but like Westport in them days would have been like a lot of towns, it was partly Republican and partly uh, a free state. But uh, the people, they turned out in their numbers that day, you know, so. Um, what's your opinion of the Good Friday Agreement? I think the Good Friday Agreement, uh, agreement in some ways was inevitable. Um, the IRA were losing the war and they were so infiltrated by, by British agents and, and there was a lot of things done which were kind of outside of even normal kind of, shall we say, paramilitary activity, uh, kind of activity that didn't sit, sit well with, I suppose, people with any kind of a conscience. And, as I say, I think the leadership of the Republic movement at the time, I, I think they realised that they weren't going to win the war and a peace agreement would have been a, a kind of a face saver. And I think, uh, I, I think the intervening time uh, kind of born, born this out. Um, what's your opinion on Republican and left-wing groups today? Do you see any of them picking up where socialist Republican left off? years ago. Well, much of the same answer like a like it's the last question. Um, I think they have to just recognise what's going on throughout the world. There's capitalism has got a firm grasp of practically everything, especially in the Western world. And unless people are prepared to take supreme sacrifices and uh, I feel there have to be martyrs somewhere along the way to get uh, that section of the population that they need behind them. At, at the moment, it's very hard to, uh, to quantify, like, what percentage of the population would be behind it, but it's far too small to, to be effective. Like when you think that in the aftermath of the, of the Cuban Revolution, Reggie Debray said something, I think it was 23 or 24 percent of the population, you need that much people behind you, active people, and it's not just enough just to have kind of tacit support, you need activists on the ground, you need people everywhere, you know, to get stuck into the into the capitalist system. You know. Mm. That's more than I say. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Frank King. Children die.